This is in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. This is narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. He said, the Kaaba will be destroyed by this Suwaiqatayn from Abyssinia. Now Suwaiqatayn is a tasgheer, is a diminutive form which shows that physically he is weak. So his skinny legs, small legs, so he's not physically a strong person. And he destroys the Kaaba. The Prophet said, it's as if I can see him. He takes it apart, brick by brick, stone by stone. He's taking the Kaaba apart, brick by brick. In other uh, narrations, some of them mentioned by Imam Ahmad and others, the Prophet describes him as asla', which means he's bald. And the other most important thing is that he is from Abyssinia. And others describe him like, you know, weak, so he's uh, lame, you know, he's got a limp. So what we're seeing is we're seeing, and why the description, we're seeing someone very weak physically, and he physically takes the Kaaba apart brick by brick. How is that possible? Well. One thing you clearly have made out already, this is obviously after the time period when there's no Hajj. Then the second thing is, because nobody knows what the Kaaba is, nobody cares what it is, he destroys it and nobody stops him because nobody knows what it's for. And it's, it's not hard to believe, isn't it? not hard to imagine. I mean, look at how people love the Kaaba today and love the Haram and love the black stone and just want to touch the Kaaba and as you get closer to it, it, you know, the roughness and pushing and how people are crazy about that place. Most beloved place on earth to the majority of Muslims on the planet. And there's going to be a day when nobody even knows what this building is and someone will destroy it brick by brick. And not even as an art piece, someone who's going to want to preserve it. It's just very sad, isn't it? Very heartbreaking. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow the destruction of the Kaaba? Here's something interesting. We know of a time when someone tried to destroy the Kaaba. This was in the year of the elephant. So first of all, this man Abraha, he was the governor of Yemen. And uh, he built a, a, a structure. He called it al Qulays in Sana'a in Yemen. And he wanted to divert, because you know what the Kaaba did for the Quraysh? It brought pilgrims from all over. It brought trade and money and merchandise from all over. You know, so he wants to divert Hajj from Al Kaaba in Mecca to Al Qulays that he built in Sana'a. So he built this building and he called all the Arabs to make pilgrimage there instead of Mecca. Now, of course, you know it's insulting, right? Like, this is the house built by Ibrahim, or at least restructured or rebuilt by Ibrahim. And now you built this thing and you're calling for Hajj or pilgrimage to Sana'a. So a man from Quraysh who happened to be there in, in Sana'a at that time, he became angry. He was really upset. So he went into it, probably at night, and he urinated and defecated all over it. He left him surprise packages, landmines, everywhere. <laughs> you know? So uh, in the morning they came, they found these surprise packages everywhere. So Abraha became so angry. So he said he's going to destroy the Kaaba. Now, if he destroys the Kaaba in Mecca, people naturally now were, are going to turn towards his building. But as long as the Kaaba is there, no one's going to look at his, his building. Nobody cares about it. So he gets an army of elephants. I mean, that's like the utmost of power here. Brings an army of elephants. And he comes with this huge army crossing through the deserts to destroy the Kaaba. At the time... The leader of the Quraysh was Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of our, of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, on the way, Abraha finds like some goats and some camels and some livestock belonging to people and the, his army just, they take it by force. So they go and complain to Abdul Muttalib. So now Abraha, he camps, right? He gets to what is known as Wadi Muhassir, which is between uh, Mina and Muzdalifa. And that's where he's camped there. And Abdul Muttalib comes to him. Now, when Abdul Muttalib entered, so Abraha knows that the leader of the Quraysh is coming to talk to him. When Abdul Muttalib entered, 
he had this heiba, he had this commanding presence and he was handsome and looked, يعني, you know, respectable. So when Abraha saw him, he, he respected him, he got up to him and he really honored him, even though he's coming to destroy the Kaaba. So then he says, what can I do for you? And he thought, now he's expecting now as this powerful man coming with this powerful army against a, a group that's not prepared to handle them that Abu Abdul Muttalib is going to plead with him and ask him and beg him and so Abdul Muttalib says yeah I um, you know your army took the some camels and some goats and on the way here so I'm just here to ask you to please return those things so Abraha was like when I saw you like I respected you I thought this was an intelligent and a wise person I'm coming here to destroy the Kaaba and you have an audience with me all you ask me for are goats you're here to ask for goats and some camels? What about the Kaaba? I thought you hear you talk about something more important. And Abdul Muttalib gave him an answer, like the most powerful answer he could possibly give him. Like just very cool about this issue. He tells him, he says, I'm the owner of the camels. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what I'm here for. As for the, the, the house, it has an owner that will protect it. No, I'm not worried about that. Just, just give me the goats. I'm, I'm not ever worried about protecting the house. Allah protect his house. I'm just here for the goats. Talk about some confidence, right? Really powerful. Anyways, so when they get to Wadi Muhassir, this valley of Muhassir, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends them the ababil birds, as we all know from Surah Al-Feel. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al-Feel. Alam yaj'al kaydahum fi tadlil. Wa arsala alayhim tayran ababil. تَرْمِيهِمْ بِحِجَارَةٍ مِّنْ سِجِّلِ It was pelting them with these stones. فَجَعَلَهُمْ كَعَصْفِ مَأْكُولِ Look completely dead and destroyed. What's the point of going into that story? Here is an example of when someone came to destroy the Kaaba and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defended the Kaaba. So this is an army of elephants, a powerful army, and Allah destroyed them. And then this weak man who is disfigured, other hadith that we said describe him as lame and crippled and hunched over and what have you, and he destroys it brick by brick. Why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroy this man? And the answer is simple. Because of a number of things. Number one, if Abraha had succeeded in destroying the Kaaba, he would have threatened the very existence of the Kaaba because he would have switched and diverted Hajj moved it to Sana'a, to the Quleis, his building, and nobody would have remembered Mecca, and they would have lost its importance. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his plan is that his final messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his final religion will be sent to this area. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then has to preserve this place. But when the Suayqatayn destroys it towards the end of time, no one has any need of it. So why should Allah defend it? For what? So he could just stand there for nobody? So you see the difference. First, the destruction, so we got two points now. The destruction of Abraha would have threatened its very existence. It would have never been rebuilt. The, first, the second uh, explanation is that, or the second reason, is that when uh, the, yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that place was still important and there was something important going to happen there, so it has to be preserved. But later on, why preserve the Kaaba? Nobody worships there, nobody knows what it's for. So why preserve it so it can just stand there? Now, there's some other also um, interesting points, and that is the Kaaba has been destroyed before. There was, and again, I'm going to be extremely brief here, but during the time of uh, Abdullah ibn Zubair, anhuma, Abdullah ibn Zubair became uh, the Khalifa. And sometimes people forget to mention that he was one of the Khulafa, and then he started, to, he had the majority of territory, then he started to lose it bit by bit until they lay siege to them in Mecca. And, uh, they needed an army now. So Ibn Zubair was inside, his army was in Mecca and in the Haram. And they need an army now to attack Mecca. And everyone's afraid to attack Mecca. So uh, an unknown soldier steps out of the ranks. Nobody knew him. Nobody knew his name. He was not famous. He was not known for anything. This man just steps out and volunteers. He says, I'll lead the army. I'll lead the charge to fight the army of Zubair inside Mecca. Because like they were besieged completely and even though nobody knew this man's name now everybody knows his name that man believe it or not was al-hajjaj ibn yusuf al-thaqafi 
Hajjaj, that's how he surfaced. He just stepped out of the crowd and volunteered to lead an army to fight the army of Ibn Zubair in, inside the, the Kaaba or, or the Haram. And, and it's funny, like uh, Al-Hajjaj, he used to be a Quran teacher. Suddenly becomes Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf Al-Thaqafi. The point is that they started with catapults, throwing rocks and, and sometimes, you know, fire and stuff like that. And so they, the catapult, there was one inside, the army of Ibn Zubair would throw at the other army and then they would throw inside. And then they threw and a rock came and it hit the Kaaba and it destroyed it. Then Qaddar Allah, a, a lightning bolt came and struck that catapult, that, that mechanism, that device, it got struck by lightning. And so everybody said, that's it, that's a sign. This is the exact device that destroyed the Kaaba and now a lightning bolt destroyed it. And so they stopped fighting. And Al-Hajjaj wants to keep going. So then, as they were discussing it and maybe even thinking of withdrawing, Qaddar Allah, that a lightning bolt comes out of the sky and hits in the army of Ibn Zubair. So now, Al-Hajjaj tells them, it's just a coincidence. So, we thought it was like a sign when ours got hit, but now theirs got hit. They weren't destroying the Kaaba. So it's just a coincidence. So they resumed fighting. Anyways, what I wanted to cite was another time when the Kaaba was destroyed. And there were other times. This was a, about 1,100 years ago in the year 317 after the Hijrah. In the 8th of the Hijjah, that means we're right in the middle of Hajj here, in the, in the season of Hajj. During uh, this time, the Abbasid dynasty, they were busy with problems all around the empire. And this happened right under their noses. This is a group known as Al-Qaramita, uh, under the leadership of a man by the name of Abu Tahir Al-Qurmuti. And this man, he led his army, and they come into the Haram. And they killed 20,000 of the Hujjaj. 20,000. This is 1,100 years ago. And they threw the majority of them into the well of Zamzam. And then they tore off and tore down the curtain of the Kaaba. They removed the door of the Kaaba. Uh, he had his horse urinating all around it and urinating into Zamzam. They removed the black stone and took it away from the Kaaba and it remained lost and hidden for 22 years before the Muslims finally got it back from Al-Qaramita. After 22 years when they got it back, it was just fragments and little pieces. That's why if you Google image uh, the black stone and you get a close up, you'll see, like, you'll see like there's a mold, a black mold, and then inside it you see eight or nine pieces inside, some of them like the size of a date. That's from the actual black stone and the rest is this mold. Because when they destroyed it, we just got nine pieces and so they created this kind of mold to put it in and that's the black stone. And this as a side note, if you kiss any of that, it counts as kissing the black stone. And it's the peak of ignorance to assume that you have to just kiss that part. And to add insult to injury, while he, he, that's happening, this guy Tahir, Haythullah Tahara, he's saying, Aina Tayrul Ababil? Where are the Ababil birds? And uh, they were even mocking the pilgrims then, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and whoever enters it, he will be safe. But they don't, they don't understand what the verse is saying. Someone who of understanding. He said, Ya Ghabi. You know, he's telling them, you're dumb. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when whoever enters that, the home or the, the house of Allah, he will be safe. It's a command for you to keep them safe. It's not saying magically nothing will happen. They will never fall or slip or get hurt or get sick. He's saying, keep them safe. Make them safe. That's what it's saying. They also then try to steal or remove the mizab. If you look at images of the Kaaba, you'll find something looking like a rain gutter almost, just sticking out like this golden, coming out like this. That's from all where the rainwater collects from the roof and comes down. This is known as the mizab. And they tried to steal the mizab, but they couldn't because the, the, the tribe of Huzayl, they were fantastic. See, there were every, the mizab is at the top, so people tried to get up to remove it, and with their arrows, they just kept shooting them and showering them with arrows. 
for, from a distance, the people of Huzayl. So why couldn't they protect the black stone? Because the black stone is down low and there are pilgrims and people and, and the crowds, they can't just shoot randomly at people. But the, up top, they couldn't steal the Mizab because of that. Now, another thing that happened, they also tried to, to take them, or they would have taken the Maqam. But uh, as Sadana, who are Bani, from Bani Shayba, as Sadana are the people who since the time of the Prophet and since before that actually, the, until today, subhanAllah, they're the ones who hold the keys and they take care of the Kaaba. So they actually removed Maqam Ibrahim and they hid it in their neighborhood, in their, in their areas. So they weren't able to take the Maqam because of that. So here is the Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stop the army or, or, or this guy, Abu Tahir, or Abu Tahir here? Why? Because you already know the answer. We said... Number one, this was after the, the, the great place that Mecca had and the Kaaba had in the hearts of people. Yani nothing was going to change it. You know, if you damage a part, people still revere and love the building. Whereas you said in the first one, it would have moved and shifted that love to Sana'a, to Al Qulays, another building, and it would have completely lost its value, the, 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 the Kaaba in Mecca. But here, people already love this place. And whether you damage it or not, it's not going to affect that in their hearts and its importance. That's one. Number two, you damage it, but it was rebuilt. Today, some of you, this is the first time to hear about Abu Tahir and Al-Qaramita. So he came and left and is being cursed by millions of Muslims for what he did. And the Kaaba is standing there. And many people don't even know that it was destroyed one day. Meaning that destruction didn't affect it. It still came back. And it didn't affect anything. People still love that place. They don't even know what happened. Many times it was destroyed. And it had no effect whatsoever. So it's still standing there. And it didn't threaten its very existence. So it recovered from it. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't protect it in the other times. And then towards the end of time doesn't protect it because the Tsuayqatayn. Nobody even cares at that point about uh, the Kaaba. Now what's interesting about the Tsuayqatayn here. In Surah Abu Dawood, the Nabi Sallallahu said, leave the Abyssinians alone so long as they leave you alone. And leave the, the Turk alone so long as they leave you alone. The Turks here, the Turkic people, not Turkish people, but Turkic people, which includes Mongolians and Uzbeks and a, a lot of people from those regions, right? What's beautiful is that this, these are guidelines for us. And we said with the signs of the Day of Judgment, the reason, one of the reasons and wisdoms behind why the Prophet ﷺ told us about them is so that we behave accordingly when the time comes. So leave the Turk as long as they leave you alone. Leave the Abyssinians alone so long as they leave you alone. These are the guidelines. That's what we follow. Anyways, so that is uh, the, basically the destruction of the Kaaba and some other times historically where the Kaaba was destroyed. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.